Hello to everyone out there listening wherever you are. I'm Nat Eliason, and welcome to Nat Chat, where right now we're focusing on what to do as a college student or recent graduate who feels they don't fit in this world of grades, classes, and one-size-fits-all careers. In this episode, we have Max Friedman. Max and I first got in touch three years ago when he was still a student in college, working on an app for finding local events called Happening. The app didn't work out, but he's worked on a number of startup-related projects since then, including his latest, GiveButter, which is a fundraising platform specifically targeted at engaging young people, a demographic normally not prone to donations. I wanted to have Max on for a few reasons. First, he was completely self-taught at programming, which allowed him to build that first app as well as subsequent projects, and we dive into how he taught himself that during the episode. Second, Max was relentless about experimenting and trying new projects as a student, which eventually led to Give Butter, which he's been able to work on full-time now as a graduate. And third, while many of the guests on this show figured out they wanted to do their own work post-graduation, Max decided it early on and did everything he could to make it happen before graduation, which he succeeded at. We cover a lot in this episode— how Max got started on these entrepreneurial projects, how he and his roommates created a viral marketing stunt that took off and eventually turned into GiveButter, how he dealt with failure and shutting down his first startup, how he negotiated with his professors to work on his own projects in class, and how he got into more of a skills mindset and out of a GPA mindset, and a lot more. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Max Friedman, and be sure to check out more about him and GiveButter after the show. As always, you can find the show notes and more at nateliason, N-A-T-E-L-I-A-S-O-N dot com slash podcast. And with that, let's bring on Max. Max, thank you so much for coming on the cast. I'm really, really excited to have you here. You got it. Excited to be here. So the audience has some idea of who you are and what you're doing from the intro. But if you ran into somebody at a cocktail party, how would you introduce yourself? Oh, uh, well, I would say my name is Max. Um, and then now I would probably describe myself just as someone I, I generally said, I just love startups. I love building things and I love building things that create scalable impact in people's lives. Now that might not be the best cocktail party intro, but like, that's me. Uh, yeah. We're going to get to what you're working on right now, but I wanted to start with this Washington Post article from just over a year ago. Three GW roommates are selling ads to give money away, maybe to you. What's that article about? So that's this crazy idea we dreamt up over a weekend uh, during a snowstorm, as the, as the article described. Um, in a nutshell, it was basically a giveaway sponsored by ads all over a website. And uh, when you when you entered to win, you could have a referral link to, to send to other people uh, to win to have a higher chance of winning. And we featured different nonprofits every day, so we'd give part of the ad revenue away to nonprofits. And it was kind of this big money spinning machine that we built up in a weekend with me and my two roommates, uh, college roommates, and uh, it went pretty well. We, had, we ended up getting a couple hundred thousand entries, gave away a couple thousand dollars, um, and now led to the startup I'm working on now. So it's a really awesome experience. So you guys built this whole site in a weekend is the site still up will we be able to send people to it afterwards um i think it actually went that we just got the notice that was like your site's been up for a year you need to renew it i don't think we renewed it Uh, (laughs) but uh maybe we can renew it for the purposes of this but it was called we give to um yeah and it was and and it led to what we're working on now which is called give butter um which has some similarities but uh yeah yeah so uh sticking on we give to you guys built it basically in a weekend right and you were all roommates like how did that start what was the impetus for it we i i had a uh, i had a background in programming um i taught myself how to code my freshman year of, of college um my my other roommate uh has seven years of experience doing freelance development just sort of also self-started taught himself how to code um and then my third roommate is just i describe him as a crazy person um <laughs> but loves startups um and uh and it's just like a really awesome human and had worked in BC. And so we all just kind of had this like itch to, to build something and create something. And, um, when we were roommates, we had never, the three of us worked on a project together. So, uh, you know, we, we had this impending storm, it was called snowstorm Jonas, um, Mm -hmm. uh, coming towards DC. And we were just like, this is it, you know, classes are going to be canceled. And we had this like four day window, um, where we literally, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, probably like, like, like movie, movie or, or book status, but you know, we literally whiteboarded ideas. We were just like, let's build something fun. Uh, that's like quick to build, 
uh, that you can just sort of like get up and running quickly. We wanted to sort of employ like growth hacking tactics. So that's kind of how it came in the form of the referral program. And just do some sort of idea. The, the basic premise is like we build something that goes viral, uh, yeah. like some sort of game or app or widget or something. And and after sort of going through a couple of different ideas, this is what we fell onto. But we were lucky to have sort of some of the prereqs, you know, coding background to be able to do it ourselves. Um, but we all had that sort of like entrepreneurial, if you can call it that, like that itch to sort of build something and create something just for fun. And how did you guys meet? You were roommates at this point, but I assume that you had connected somehow before that around this interest in entrepreneurship, right? Yeah. So we met through, we, we met at GW. Um, we come from all different areas. I'm from New Hampshire. Ari is from San Diego. And then Liran is from uh, New Jersey. And we, they're, they're actually a year younger than me. So I'm, I recently graduated um, as, this is my senior year. They're both juniors. Uh, but we all met their freshman year. Um, so about two or three years ago, um, I started the GW Startups Club. That's how I met Liron, and Liron and I worked on an app together. And then Ari, we met uh, through we actually met at Shabbat Services at through Chabad um, at his freshman year. And so from there, we just sort of uh, I had this relationship with Liron where we were working on projects together, and Ari was always sort of a really good friend, but we hadn't worked on anything. And then it just the stars kind of aligned um, my junior my junior year and they had two roommates that went abroad and, and I ended up moving into a room with them. And then sure enough, a couple of weeks later we built, we give two. So, uh, nice. kind of took that impetus of like getting all of us in the same room together, um, to make things happen. But yeah, we, we kind of had this like two, two year running relationship of just sort of spitballing ideas and, and, and collaborating on little things here and there. And then what you guys built with, we give two has now turned into give butter, which you're all also working on, right? Yes, correct. So, uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so tell us a bit more just about that and what that is. Yeah, so Give Butter started. It's it's sort of a, a funny leap, um, but we had built We Give Two. We ran it for a month. We had some exposure, like you mentioned, that article in the Washington Post um, that led us to talk to a lot. At first, we just featured nonprofits, the Red Cross, uh, United Way, and then all of a sudden, we were getting inbound requests from the World Wildlife Fund to to be featured, and so that was really interesting that's to us. Cool. And we we started to have some of these conversations to say, well, what about this is interesting to you. And, um, and the, the biggest thing that come, coming back to was that they have no idea how to reach younger donors. They have no idea how to, their average donor age is 65 years old. Um, wow. we have all these like funny quotes, we have like a quote wall, um, of things that they were saying, you know, like Jim runs our Snapchat account he's 60 years old. And like, um, <laughs> you know, it's just this, like, it, it just sort of play on this disconnect between big bulky archaic nonprofits and, and like a younger generation of people that want to give back, don't necessarily know how, don't necessarily trust nonprofits, just a lot of like, underlying issues in, in, in this problem. And so we were really interested in that. And we knew that what we built was kind of gimmicky. It was kind of hard to recreate. And it was really fun, but we felt like it was hard to sort of um, create like sort of a recurring um, like business around that or, or like an idea that actually created a real impact. And so it timed up really interestingly where our friend was starting a nonprofit kosher food truck in Washington, D.C., and we had this idea of, well, what if we kind of translated some of the things we learned from We Give Two, some of these conversations we have with nonprofits, built this like modern fundraising platform where instead of just facilitating a transaction, it was more about making a, building a community around a cause, um, having donors be able to tell their stories about why they're giving. And, and, uh, and really, we sort of described it almost like an Instagram feed of donations, which is really like fun and social and engaging. And that campaign raised $16,000 in 24 hours. Nice. Um, that was very much like a crowdfunding campaign. And we kind of ran with it. So we learned a lot about some of the inefficiencies we found in fundraising generally. Um, and, uh, you know, I can make a lot of, I can talk a lot more about it, but that was sort of how we started Give Butter. And um, it was through some of those conversations, really learning about the problem, but then also just by our whole theme, like the theme of everything that we've ever done to this point has just been just like, just build it, just build it, just put it out there and see what people think, see how people interact with it. Um, and, and then, and then sort of base all your decisions off of feedback like that. So that was how we started Give Butter. But you obviously didn't, you didn't study entrepreneurship or business type stuff, did you? No. Okay. So how are you learning to kind of run and grow this company then? <laughs> um, by making a lot of mistakes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we never, there's, there's definitely not. Um, it's funny. So going back to my like freshman year, Mm -hmm. uh, when I first got the like entrepreneur itch and like I came to, so I came to George Washington university. I was interested in politics, like all the classic reasons why you go to a school like GW. And, uh, slowly I just started reading articles about like Mark Cuban. 
uh, I like would read entrepreneur.com. I would read, I would listen to like podcasts about entrepreneurship and like, I didn't necessarily learn a whole lot. I just got really like into the idea. It was like, this sounds really cool. I started like writing ideas down on my computer and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then again, sort of that theme was, I just sort of started doing things. Like I had an idea for this, this app. Um, and so I spent my freshman year summer working at a re working a retail, retail job. I worked at Brookstone, uh, you know, those places where you get the massage, the massage chairs in the mall. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and then when I wasn't working there, I was teaching myself how to code. Uh, and so from there it was like, uh, you know, just learn by doing. So put the app out there and then, you know, have only a hundred people download it on your first day. And you're like, well, crap, I, I should have had a better, like, you know, launch strategy. Uh, and then, and then, you know, Oh, I need to incorporate, you know, you just sort of, you Google this, you Google that, you ask a friend for advice. Uh, and it's just been this sort of theme of like doing things, making mistakes, learning from those mistakes, but also having a good network of like mentors and people that can, you can like turn to for questions, whether that's like, should I patent this? Should I, you know, what's a good way to do my taxes? Like, you know, we just did our like a first real taxes for give butter and, uh, you know, having the right people in place to sort of say like, well, how do I account for this? How do I do that? Um, you know, find me, you know, like, like these sort of like fundamental questions that like when you're thinking about starting a business, it's like, oh my God, like my taxes, uh, you know, incorporating, but having good people and also just sort of like having the confidence to like, just go for it and like, you'll make mistakes, but like be like, you'll learn from those and then you won't make it again. Um, that's sort of how I've gone about it, but definitely no formal education. And if anything, I think a formal education is kind of like, Everyone always says the best education you can get is just by sort of doing it. Uh, just, just do it. <laughs> and, <I keep. laughs> and you mentioned in there that you taught yourself how to code as well. Can you tell us more about how you were able to do that? Yeah. Uh, so what I did was, I think a little non-traditional, just based on like what other people typically do for teaching themselves how to code. But I actually bought a textbook on Java and just read it cover to cover and did all the exercises. <laughs> That's um, hardcore. Yeah, like old school. Um, but like what it did for me was I learned the fundamentals of programming. Like I really, I learned everything from it. It's statement to a for loop to a, you know, how to just write logic, like just, just code. Uh, and, and that's been such like, that's such a fundamental thing that you can take from language to language. Um, from there, I built an app in Objective-C uh, that I rewrote probably 10 times. But it was just sort of like that theme again of, of, of um, I, I took the book, I read it cover to cover, I did the exercises. Um, I found a couple people on the, like in the like GitHub back overflow world that I actually like emailed and I actually would ask them questions and stuff and they were pretty responsive. Um, but just like, uh, just sort of like learning the fundamentals really hardcore and then I had an idea. And so by building it, I learned a lot just by doing that, uh, which I always encourage people is like, if you have an idea, that's like the best way to learn because you'll just Google things and, and, and you'll have something, it'll keep you motivated. Cause you're like, Oh cool. I'm actually like making my idea come to life. I remember the first time I did like a two plus two equals four and like printed four. Mm. I was like, mom, like type two enter. And it was like, add another number like two. And I was like, it's equals four. And I was like flipping out. I was like, Oh my God, my computer just did that. And I wrote the code to do it. Um, so seeing like having that like positive, um, uh, sort of like visualization of what you're doing, I think was really cool for me. Definitely. And where were you getting the ideas for these apps and projects that you were using to teach yourself how to code? <laughs> Good question. I, I, I actually used to have a lot more, uh, I like creativity now that I'm working on one idea so intensely. Uh, it's, I've, I've actually had less of it, but in the past it would, I would really yeah. like, I would just sort of like go about my life and I'd be like, you know, that's inconvenient or like, that's kind of annoying or I don't like that. And then I would try to think of solutions. Um, but it always kind of starts with that problem. Like, it's like the classic, like the problem statement. And so like I had this idea, and this might exist, but like I was obsessed with this idea of like, why in the world do I have to move my clothes from the washer to the dryer? Why can't it just like wash and dry itself and then fold itself? You know, like why is this like, like laundry is such a pain in the butt, you know? And so like, and like that was just like one of many ideas. Um, I don't know. I had this whole, this whole book of them. And so it was just kind of like, going about your life. I think when people look like when they're actively trying to start something, um, which we sort of did with the, with the, we give to idea, but I think that's a little bit different, but like when people are trying to really build, I think people often start with the solution without a real problem. And, uh, mm -hmm. I think the best ideas typically come to you by accident. And it's like, it's sort of like, it's not something that you can be re like, it's not a repeatable, but, 
uh, or something that you can just sort of like, well, okay, well now what do I do? I just sort of like walk around and then try to like, hopefully something goes wrong. And then I start a company and it's not like that. It's just like, um, I, that's sort of how I've always gone about is, is sort of like very, very personally, what do I see as sort of like problems that could be created that could sort of be solved or done better. And typically that's through technology. That's just sort of for me. And you mentioned that you kept a, a book of ideas. Was that something that you carried around with you and would add things to, or just kind of at the end of the day, as things kept coming? It was actually a mind? sticky note, like on my computer, or like one of those, uh, like uh, uh, not an actual sticky note, one of those like computer generated sticky notes. Oh, the sticky notes app, yeah, yeah, yeah something like that. Um, and I just had a running list of of ideas. I should totally like re rediscover that. Um, but I remember when I so I applied to Y Combinator for my first the first app I did. And it was like, tell us another idea that you uh, that you might be thinking about. And I just copy pasted my <laughs> list of ideas. It was like a hundred ideas. Uh, nice. But yeah, that was just sort of that was sort of how I went about it. So that first app was that happening? Yeah, it was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a bit more about that? Because I think it's a good story of you know you learned a lot and worked on it, but you did ultimately end up shutting it down, right? Correct, yeah. And I was just talking to my friend the other day about it who worked on it with me, how it's unbelievable how I spent really two years of my life uh, working on this thing that doesn't exist anymore. So it's not in the app store anymore. Um, didn't want to pay the $99 a year. And, and, and actually, we built the whole app on a, on a framework called Parse that Facebook owned and recently shut down. So the whole app just didn't work and it would require a total you know, rewriting. But um, yeah, so happening, happening was the first that first idea that I've alluded to that was like, I had this idea and I, I spent my summer working on learning how to code and then building it. But, uh, I learned, I learned a tremendous amount, even though there's literally nothing tangible left except for like a happening t-shirt, uh, mm-hmm. of what we did. It, it, it led, it opened so many doors and, and connected me to so many people. And I learned so many skills that have been able to empower like the, the things that I'm working on now. But uh, yeah, that's sort of like a summary of it. Well, and what was the app? Oh, so sorry. So the app was an event app. It was sort of like a really easy way to find out what was what was happening. So it was like, I am, you know, I'm free tonight. And typically, you might think of I want to go to uh, this restaurant, or I want to go to, uh, you know, you think of it sort of like a venue or this bar uh, with right. friends. And we were sort of trying to say, well, there's all these really cool events happening there, whether it's a happy hour, or like a Red Sox game, or a show or a concert, or, uh, you know, you name it, there's a lot of event driven things happening. But and sort of, sort of pre-filtering by what you were interested in. But then if you could, our idea was if we could build enough of a social network around it, it would also be like, well, here's what all my friends are interested in doing too, or here's what my friends are going to. Uh, and sort of showing you the very best events based on your personal interests and also what your friends were doing uh, and solving for that use case. Like, oh, what's happening? I want to do something fun. Um, but we learned that a number of things in the event space that were difficult to solve for was that not like everyone thinks about events very differently. There are procrastinators and then there are, people who are planners. And so some people will plan to go to a Red Sox game three months in advance, and some people will look for the cheap last-minute tickets. Those are completely different use cases. Um, and then there's also people who are very uh, reliant on like what their friends are doing, and so they're more of a follower. And, the, and then there's there's the alpha who's like making the plans, who's sort of like, let's do this tonight, and everyone sort of like goes along with that. But then there's a couple all of that with the fact that like people, I don't believe people necessarily need an app uh, to see what events are going on. People generally have a good enough idea or they already have something enough in mind and really what they just need is a good discovery tool it's kind of like and a lot of that exists whether it's through a ticket vendor or like a seat geek or something that sort of like shows all the events it's really easy to uh um to sort of filter for that so i think it's a space that every it's kind of funny i don't, I don't want to ramble about this too long if it's not interesting but um i was in san francisco and i heard the founder of box.com speak uh his name is aaron levy and I was in a room full of entrepreneurs. He goes, uh, raise your hand if, you, uh, if you're working on an event app. <laughs> and like four people raised their hand. There was like 70 people in the room. And he goes, you're at, you're, like, it's not going to work, guys. <laughs> like, just, just, Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just not going to work. Uh, he goes, I did the same thing. He, everybody does the same thing. He's like, everybody uh-huh. gets to college and they're like, what events are going on? Uh, like, there needs to be an events app. And he's, he's, he's right. And, and it's very common. And, and it's sort of like, that was, it was, it was cool to hear this guy who's now CEO of a billion dollar public company to say that, you know, that's where he started. Um, he, that was a really cool, really cool thing. But yeah, that was, that hit me hard. And, uh, and actually pretty shortly after that, I stopped working on it. 
is that what sort of made you feel like it was time to shut it down or what gave you that recognition that you kind of needed to stop working on it and focus on other things? Yes, it's a great question. That was one of the hardest things I'd ever done because sunk cost is, is really hard to, to overcome. Uh, Can you explain sunk cost just in case anyone doesn't know what it is? Sure. So it's just the idea of um, basically time that's already spent uh, and like the idea of, um, you know, if you already invest $100,000 in something, well, that, that money's gone. If you just spend a, you know, two years of your life, that, that time is gone. And so you have this sort of inherent tie to the time and money that you already spend. But a lot of, I believe it's accounting uh, principles say that you should ignore sunk cost um, and make decisions based on sort of future outcomes. And that applies to life too. And so, um, you know, so for me, the, the sunk cost, the, the, the corollary is, is like I, I spent two years of my life uh, working on this app and, and, and the result was, you know, we had about 10,000 or 15,000 downloads, you know, pretty low active users. We were not making money. We did a couple events, sort of like promotional events where we would work with a venue and, and try to get people to their event and then we would make money, but it was nominal. It was very small amounts of money. And so, um, it was just like, but the thing was we kept getting these small little validators. So, we had press. We, uh, you know, I was featured in an article that called me the next Mark Zuckerberg, uh, which was like the coolest thing ever at the time. But also, I mean, like the amount of pressure I felt to actually like get even remotely close to that was kind of overwhelming. And it felt I had this sort of like paradox of like imposter syndrome, where like on one front, you know, I kept I was I had this sort of knack for getting press, but at the on, on the other hand, and you know, it was like I knew the numbers, I knew things just weren't really picking up, and. A lot of it was also on me when I was the one also developing. Uh, so if I wanted to make a big change on the product, I would have to spend a lot of time building that. And then if I wanted to market, you know, I mean, so these initiatives took a lot of time and, and effort across the board. And so um, the problem was that I'm trying to articulate is no one was like slapping me over the over the head saying, you know, you got to shut it down. It really took a lot for me to be like, you know, I think I need to move on. Uh, at that point, I had gone through my freshman, sophomore and halfway through my junior year working on this this idea that wasn't generating any money and I was spending enormous amounts of time and I was not really paying attention in class I was staying up very very late uh working on this idea that wasn't really generating anything in, in, in return and, and I did there was no sure thing of success and you know then you start creating pressures of like well I need <laughs> I'm a junior you know I need to get a job uh mm. I'm not making any money and and so that was really stressful and so I around New Year's time that year like January or December I, I just sort of decided I needed it was it was hard I just kind of went home for winter break and came to t- came to terms with it. And the first thing I did was I just called everybody I'd met along the way, told them, and then brainstormed with them what I should do next. And uh, it kind of led in a lot of different directions. But um, now I think that's when I actually reached out to you about, I was wondering if you wanted to be a part of this. Uh, <laughs> I just yeah, I think that for, is when we talked. It is when yeah. we talked, yeah. This, I wanted to create a bunch, like a college student network of developers and designers and people who could do like freelance, freelancing projects. Didn't end up going that route. I took on a freelancing project myself, but... That was how I ended up coming to this idea. It was it was one of the hardest decisions I ever made, but I'm glad I did it. You mentioned in there towards the end that you would hit this point junior year where you realized you needed to make money and maybe get a job. Was that scary? Were you worried about being viable post graduation? Oh, it freaked me out. It was like my biggest fear because uh, I loved what I was doing so much. It was just yeah. that financial insecurity that held me, that really just stressed me out a lot. Uh, I really wanted financial independence and just being able to like, just do like, I really loved what I was doing. I loved being able to, I loved, like I said at the very beginning, how I'd introduced myself at a cocktail party. I'm, I'm a total dork. You know, I love building products and I love, uh, like I loved what I was doing and I was really scared that I would lose a lot of that autonomy and uh, I had never really worked a real job. Like I kind of, I mean, I worked a lot of like service jobs. I worked, I worked, you know, at Brookstone, I worked as a sandwich. I made sandwiches in high school. I, you know, I volunteered. I mean, I did a lot of like that sort of um, the hard gritty work, but I never really worked a corporate job. You know, I never went to a, a, a consulting firm or interned at the Hill or did all the things that like a lot of GW students do. And so the idea of me then like my junior year without having really much of a resume except for this app, I kind of was like, Oh God, like I really need to need to do something here um, or else, you know, time's ticking. I mean, it's going to be my senior year and I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, you know, have a, have a really uh, solid paying job. Um, and so that was, that's, that's scared me a lot. Yeah. And you mentioned that you took on some freelancing work right after that, right? Yeah. So I, I have a really good mentor who kind of said to me, 
uh, you know, he did something like this and he followed a similar path. And what was really important to him was he had some coding skills and he was able to do some consulting or freelancing or something. And what's cool about doing that, that I think is relatable for a lot of people is when you dig on a freelancing project, even if it's just one or, or, or something, it, it establishes this level of confidence for you that you can, if everything goes to crap, you know, if everything, if everything uh, doesn't work out with your startup or your idea or your, whatever you're working on to know that you have like a floor for yourself, like here's what I'm worth almost like I could go out at any point, get a freelancing job and make, you know, $30 an hour, 40, 50, whatever that number is, is really valuable. Cause then it's sort of always, you always know that uh, you're able to support yourself even if you're without a job or even if your thing isn't working or even if you need to make a little extra money on the side to support your idea. Um, and so doing that project, it, it, I learned that I didn't love freelancing, but I learned that it was always an opportunity for me, like that even after college, if I didn't have that stable job that I was describing, I could still freelance. I could still have that level of autonomy. I can still, um, build products. Um, you know, so it, it wasn't ideal was what I wanted to do, but I knew that like I had a floor for myself and, and that I, uh, could always build on top of that. Yeah, I had a really similar realization because my senior fall, I was in essentially the same position. But when I got those first couple of freelancing gigs, it made me way more confident about being financially secure post graduation. You mentioned financial, you mentioned that you wanted to be financially independent post grad. What does that mean to you? Oh, man. It's kind of funny. I, I actually, I want to hear your answer to this, uh, Nat. Uh, sure. <laughs> I always, I like framing it like this. If I had a million dollars, what would change about my life? Um, and the answer, quite frankly, is very little. Uh, I am a total, like, I've, I've found ways to save on rent and save on food. You know, I, I, this, this last couple months, I've just done bulk shopping at Costco, and I love what I eat. I cook, like, the most amazing meals on a very, very, very low budget. And, uh, you know, I, and I love what I'm doing. Like, I'm very happy in, in, in those respects. And so, and I love, like, my roommates. Like, even if I had a bunch of money, I wouldn't go, like, buy some, like, bachelor pad on the penthouse of a building. I mean, I really like where I am. And so like, you know, and I'm, and it's not very, um, expensive, but it still costs money. You know I mean, it's just still money that needs to be paid and accounted for and, and also like so on and so forth. But, um, I guess financial independence is just sort of like, uh, it's something that is, um, I think when you hit that point where you really can say nothing would change, like if I had, if I had more money, you know, and that's what, that's what it means for me is like, well, I needed to get to that, that lowest level where I could hit my basics and be happy. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm getting there, you know, but if, if I had more money, it wouldn't necessarily make a big difference in my life. It's kind of like the standard deviation of, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but like the increasing, uh, there's like an economic term. Um, it's almost like economies of scale or like the marginal, yeah, returns. marginal returns. Like they yeah. become smaller and smaller, the more money you have. And I think getting to that point where it becomes very small, like just, you know, having 10,000, a hundred thousand, a million more dollars really doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, that's where I think, I, and, and I think that's sort of my, I guess, threshold, if that makes sense. But yeah, I, mean, I would ask you the same thing is sort of like, you know, if you had a million dollars, how would that change your life? And I think that's just like a really interesting question because so many people like money is such a cornerstone to their happiness. And I think asking that question and then, and then asking yourself, well, that would that make me happy? And I think that's like such an interesting way to think about money and how it actually does relate to your happiness. Yeah. And for me, cause I had really similar goals and I did an exercise that it sounds like maybe you also did consciously or unconsciously where for a while in college, I just wanted to see how inexpensively I could live because that gave me a really good metric of uh, the absolute minimum amount of money I would need to make to not have to go get a job I didn't want. And doing that exercise was really helpful because then I knew, okay, worst case scenario, I can always you know, run to Argentina, live really low cost of living for a few months and get back on my feet if something I'm working on goes completely to shit and I lose all income, right? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> So I think for me, it's very similar to you where a big part of it just comes down to it's not even so much financial independence, but time independence, where I want the smallest amount possible of my time going to things that I don't want to work on or spend time on. And I mean, the best way you get that optionality is through a certain amount of income from things that you care about doing or passively from other projects. So I mean, very 
very similar definitions. And I think it's a common goal for a lot of college students who are looking at the career prospects of their peers or even their parents or what they see around them and just aren't excited by it and want to have that option to not necessarily not work, but work on things and make decent money that they're excited about doing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's an interesting um, practice to figure out what are those metrics. Like, you know, and, it, and it's something that like you don't really when you're living, you know, if you're fortunate enough to you know have a good roof over your head and you grow up, you know, living with your parents and then you go to college and you graduate and it's like, how much do you actually spend on food per month and how much is like a normal rent or how it's a low rent? And like, yeah. you know, I, I, I learned that pretty early on in college just to figure out what those numbers look like. But like for people, I think it's a big learning curve to figure out like how much money do you really need and how much is like, you know, what, what are those numbers? And I think it's something that a lot of young people are kind of naive about or just don't know much about it. Like you have to kind of experience that, which has been a really interesting process. I always say to, it's kind of funny. I, like I don't, there's a lot of little things that I cut out. Like I, I don't pay a lot of subscriptions. I don't pay a lot of, um, you know, I don't sign up for Netflix. I don't have Apple Music. But I just listen to the ads. And there's like a lot of like little things that can save money over time that um, I think um, people necessarily like, like, oh, it's just, like, it's just $5 a month. You know, like, well, you know, you do that with a lot of things. So, but anyway, I, I think it's definitely an interesting practice as someone who's in college or young, just to sort of like start learning about like, oh, how much, how much could I spend on food or this per month? And I know you have like a, a runway calculator I remember that you put on your on your site which I remember I, I, I looked at when I was at the time it was very timely for me because I was interested in that stuff but yeah super cool really interesting well I think it also saves you from the trap of assuming you need to make as much money as possible I think that's what oh for sure a lot of students and postgrads kind of just get sucked into I know I definitely did and when you never sit down and do the math then you might miss out on opportunities that would be much more exciting because you think that they won't pay enough, but in reality, they completely would. Absolutely. You mentioned a few points ago that, and you've brought it up a couple of times, that you had these mentors who helped you figure out next projects or that you could go to with business questions. How did you meet these people? (laughs) Um, So I tried to intern for one of them. Um. And, uh, he kind of was like, let's just be friends, which was one of the best things that's ever happened to me. So, I mean, I was, I was really lucky in that regard. And that was my freshman year. That was when I was starting to get interested in startups. And I was like, I should work for a startup. He happened to be a, an alumni of GW. Um, and, uh, and it just sort of, uh, clicked. He had just raised a big funding round. I saw it in the news. And so I sent him an email and, and tried to apply it. And then we got coffee and the, the rest is history. I, I told him about some ideas I had and he kind of pushed me to, to actually start it myself. Um, you know, and, and I, instead of, you know, working in the inter- doing an internship and, um, that was really valuable. And then over time, um, I've just been really lucky to, uh, a lot of it is, um, a combination of luck, timing, you know, using your existing network to, to be introduced to cool people. And I think the best mentor relationships that I've had have been friendships. They're really, they're not this formal, uh, coffee you know once a month kind of thing and it, and it can be that but they're really like at the, at the root of it is they're my, they're my friends and they're my friends first and, and they also happen to be uh mentors and, and the people that i go to for advice and i think i think and that's been my experience and i know people that have had very formal mentor relationships that have been really great but um having them at all i think is really important having them as friends i think is the best uh possible scenario and i think using um sort of uh um, I don't know, taking advantage of, of, of opportunities. Like I, one of the, one of the, I'm trying to think of some examples. One of the men, one of our mentors, Ari, my co-founder, um, met, uh, who was in DC, uh, his name is Tom Rafa. He runs an accounting firm that works with some of the largest nonprofits in the world. So they're really great. He was just a really great person to speak to for us. Um, if you ever listened to this, he'd probably laugh, but we, we crashed a conference that he was speaking at specifically to speak to him. Um, we, we really knew that he was someone that we wanted to loop into what we were doing, not necessarily as a mentor, just, just as someone that had a lot of valuable experience and connections and what we were doing. And, and so we really were targeted. Um, that's the only time I've ever done something like that was, was like, I went to this conference to, specifically to speak to him. We did sure enough, we met and now he's, he works very closely with us. So, you know, it can work in a lot of different ways, but I guess the, the underlying theme is mentors are very, they, they're just invaluable. Um, in many different ways. Changing pace just a little bit here, you mentioned that 
you had a bit of this, I guess you would call it realization freshman year that you wanted to pursue these more entrepreneurial projects, work for yourself. Was that ever difficult with uh, fitting in in the college system and especially around peers and grades and managing all of that? Was it psychologically taxing, difficult? Did you ever struggle with any kind of depression from it? <sighs> um, it's been a roller coaster. There's this funny graphic of like the entrepreneur roller coaster and it's just like the highs and the lows. And, and, and it's um, it's like some days are the best days ever. You know, you get a certain piece of feedback. Someone says something, someone used what you're doing or, or, or I don't know. There's just things that are very exciting. But then there's those moments that are like really, really low where you're just questioning like what, what's the point of it all, especially when you're on your own. So like a lot of my first startup was independent. Like I was a solo um, founder until I brought on Liron, who I'm now working on in Give Butter. But that was that was later. So like a good year of happening was very like on my own. And you get to these points where, you know, you're up very late or you're waking up early and, and you're just, you know, or at least, at least in the environment that I was doing it in college, um, where it was, it was hard. It was very lonely. And, and I don't know if I would, I would say depression, but it just was like a lot of self doubt, a lot of like, you know, feeling like you, um, especially when it wasn't out there, <laughs> like for a while, it was very hard to explain to people what I was doing all the time. It was kind of like, uh, you know, it was like, I was spending a lot of time on this thing that took me about a year to build. And it was like, well, you know, I'm working on this idea and I would try to show them a beta and then it would crash. And I'd be like, well, it's like, I need more work. And it just, so it was definitely hard. And, and fitting that around school just makes it much more difficult where, um, you know, I would spend a lot of time working on it during class and then I would maybe not um, do as well in the class or take, not take notes and then not do well on the exam. I kind of had this theme starting my sophomore year where I would actually meet with the professor in the beginning of the year and just be like, Hey, I'm like working on this thing. I'm not trying to be rude during a class. I'm not paying attention. I'm just like, <laughs> like, here's what I'm working on. Just kind of being like, I'm not, I'm not just like on Facebook. Um, which was good. I'd say like, wait, were they cool with that? Sometimes. Um, I would put it at like 80%. They were cool. Some of them were like, what are you like? Why? Why? Like, what are you doing? Um, like, why are you even in the class then? Um, yeah. and, it was sort of, but, but like, I just kind of wanted, cause like, I, it was like a respect thing. It was like, I want you to know that like, I respect you and I'm, I'm interested and I'm studying and, and like, I would, I would cram. I said very late before tests and just like, I'm a good, like short term, like I can memorize things well. So that just sort of worked for me. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, it, it kind of had this recurring theme and I also learned that doing poorly on the first tests, uh, and then improving was like a really great way to ensure like a good grade. Um, mm -hmm. and so like I really, in the beginning of the semesters would kind of take it easy and just like whatever. And then you kind of learn what the exam is like and you can better prepare for the next one. And then if you can show growth, you know, you get a C on the first test and then being an A, they're like, Oh great. And they'll give you a good grade. Um, but going the other way or like, you know, falling off at the end of the semester, usually not a good, not a good trick, but yeah, that's sort of me. I, <laughs> this kind of became more of a theme towards my senior year, but, um, it was long story short, definitely a, a difficult experience but also like you know I, I think I think it's college is like a really interesting time where if you're lucky and you you know whether it's you're on debt you're on scholarship you're paying you know if you if you have to work to, to put yourself through college um, while you're in college it makes it very difficult to, to do something like what I did um, you know but if if you have the opportunity college is sort of like this this risk uh, low risk opportunity to not only like have ideas, enter business plan competitions, meet people. Like while you're a student, everyone says it's like while you're a student, like people will love meeting with you. And as soon as you're in the real world, it's like you're an adult. Um, there's just like oh, so many opportunities that like I'm glad, even though classes made it very difficult. Like I'm glad I did what I did when I did it. Um, uh, to to sum it up, I guess even though there were things that made it very hard and stressful and difficult. You mentioned in there that there was a decent amount of self-doubt. How did you handle that? If you did handle it or how have you learned to handle it since then? I wouldn't, you know, I don't know if, if I have uh, totally learned to handle it. Um, I mean, the, the the nature of entrepreneurship when you're, especially when you're young, especially when you're young is like you, you inherently don't really have experience doing what you're doing. Um, it's not like a job where you, you know, spend five or 10 years working yourself up to management and then you're 
uh, you have all this experience. Um, I think I kind of have solved for it. Uh, I kind of said this earlier, but just by doing things, making mistakes and, and learning from them. Uh, a big thing that I've been thinking about lately is presentation of yourself. So like uh, everything from just the way you dress, the way you look to the way you talk and the way you present yourself. You know, I kind of had this attitude for a while of like, I could just wear a t-shirt around to important meetings and like, you know, that's what startup people do. And like, you know, whatever. And I, I don't know, I think there's a lot of things that you can do to solve for um, sort of like this self-doubt, in it, in it, but it's like different for every person. So for me, it was a combination of like just putting myself out there, learning from mistakes, and then feeling like, well, I had experience making mistakes, so I could, uh, you know, feel feel better about doing that thing because I already did it and I learned, and, and this is, I feel good about this outcome. Other people want to like sort of like account for all the um, possible outcomes and like are very like more methodical and, and, and particular about it. For me, I just sort of learned by doing, and I, I know I've said that a lot, but I think that's probably the best way I solve for self doubt, but it's an ongoing struggle for me. It's just kind of like, you know, uh, when you manage, so we, I didn't really mention too much about this, about give butter, but you know, uh, we have 250 student ambassadors. And so to me, that's like, Oh my God, like we have all these people that are, um, you know, I've never managed that many people. Uh, or anything like that but you just it, it's something that you just sort of learn by doing and and you know uh and that's how i've sort of and now we've had we have two full semesters under our belt of managing the program and i feel very confident going forward about growing it managing it how we can make it better uh, but that would never happen if i continued to doubt myself and just be like oh, i'm not sure i don't know so yeah that's that's sort of how i guess i solve for it you mentioned sort of back on the theme of doing all of this in college and some of the self-doubt and challenges there. You mentioned talking to the professors and letting them know that you're probably going to be working on this app in their class. Did you have any other kind of college hacks that let you allocate your time better to these side projects without having to spend as much time on course load and homework? Any other hacks to like not have as much time being spent on? Uh, yeah, well, it, it seems it seems like you were deliberately trying to allocate as right. much of your time as possible to your own learning and your own projects. Was there anything else that helped a lot with getting more of that time back for yourself? That's a really good question. I would, so I ended up studying my mate, my, I graduated with a computer science and finance degree. Uh, for my computer science classes, I managed to turn every group project and do like a project for my startup idea. Ooh, smart. And so like I would take you know, I would get lucky. I would get like three or four CS students that didn't necessarily have an idea or didn't necessarily um, care too much about what they worked on, like the idea that I had an idea and like was really passionate about it. And I would leverage that to sort of get a couple like free um, computer science majors to like build out an idea or like build out a, whether it was like I had an existing idea. So like for Happening, I helped, they, they helped build me, um, we worked together to build a uh, way to scrape events uh, off, off websites. And then sometimes I had an idea that was just like, I just had an idea and I would find a way to incorporate whatever the CS project was for that idea and make it all work. Um, so that was something I definitely did that I guess save myself time, but also was really valuable. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the most immediate thing I guess I can think of. Did you ever leverage any kind of directed studies or independent work uh, to get credit for that? I didn't, but I, it, it was kind of hard to do so. Um, what I did do though is I did graduate a semester early and that was huge because I, you get all the positive externalities of still being like technically a senior, your friends are still in school, you're like near the, like just from like a fun social, like you're just like, you're basically a college student without having to go to class. Um, yeah. And, and I was able to do that just by being smart about the classes I took for my freshman year. I just was like, I'm going to double count and optimize my schedule for maximum efficiency and you know, I graduated with two majors and I only took, I came in with three AP classes worth of credit and I took a summer class and then I, and I took, I maxed out my schedule. So like I was able to over like as much overlap as I could, you know, like, Oh, this religion class satisfies an international requirement in CS and finance. And then boom, I have both checked off. Um, doing things like that for my freshman year was, it helped me be able to do that. Um, uh, but no, I didn't take advantage of any, um, sort of like independent opportunities to, to, to do anything like that. 
but it was not easy to. That was the thing. So I, like, I remember like looking into it, but like to do so, you had to you know write a fifty page paper or, or do a bunch of research. I mean, it wasn't like a walk in the park, at least for GW. Um, Got it. But yeah. It sounds like then at some point you made a switch between, or maybe you always thought this way, but switching from caring more about GPA and grades to skills and experience. Is that right? For sure. 100%. Do you remember what made that switch for you? If if there was some kind of moment that woke you up to thinking more that way? I think I became that way, I guess, sort of through the first idea that I had and by because like, what I found really interesting was the idea that I had and what I was working on was something that I completely taught myself outside of college, outside of going to university. And that idea was just really interesting to me that like I could have like a really tangible skill that like I could go out and, and maybe do a freelancing project or, or work without ever, without, without having ever gone to school. Um, and that idea really captivated me and me and really shifted my mindset. I used to say, cause there's um, an accounting term that's like just in time accounting. I think like Toyota pioneered it. And it's like this idea that, you know, when you want to build a car, you don't have a bunch of cars already built. You say, I want to have a Toyota Camry. And then they assemble the Toyota Camry and they ship it to you just in time, like as in real time. And so I came up, I was really obsessed with this idea of like just in time learning. You know, you want to, you want to build something. You want to, you want to design something. You want to create something. You need to make a video. You like learn the skills to do it on the fly. And you're not going to be the best at it. And, 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 you know, having that skill already in the bank is, is always better than having to learn it on the fly, but like it, it saves yourself a lot of time. And like I, I view college as like, you like have this like knowledge bank where you're just like storing up ideas and thoughts and, and knowledge that's not immediately applicable and you lose an enormous amount of it over time. And that concept to me just really bothers me. And, and, and I remember when I would go to class and I would be learning about like international macroeconomics and I'm like, you know, this is cool and it's interesting, but like, I had all these like things I was working on right here, right now for this app idea or this, whatever I was working on. And those require like skills that I could, if I was sitting in a class right now for, you know, how to like model view controller, uh, or object oriented programming, one like that would have been a lot more valuable to me in that moment. And I would have rather been in that class. And so like, that's when my mind just started shifting as I was like building things and teaching myself things on my own to this more of a, like, uh, I don't know. I love that. I want to like trademark this. Maybe this is my first uh, public. I'll have to trademark this before the podcast comes out. But you know, just in time accounting. That's that's or just in time learning. Uh, I'm really I'm really into that idea. Yeah, the a similar analogy I really like is push versus pull knowledge, mm. where college is kind of organized around just pushing knowledge onto you and hoping that you hold on to it. Whereas pull is very like I need to know this thing, and so I'm going to go find it and take it and add it to my existing skill set or knowledge set yeah oh exactly that's exactly it do you think that college was valuable for you yes undoubtedly so but not for the reason college is supposed to be valuable so i've thought a lot about this and at the end of the day i'm doing something i love and i'm doing it with people i love and that would not have been possible without me coming to college and 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 like the benefits that come with that. Now, college is often associated with like the classes that you take, the professors that you have. And frankly, I wasn't super satisfied with, with that experience. Um, as I've said, but you know, I, I, I'm the, my two co-founders I met by going to school. Uh, the mentor I met was because he went to this school. That was one of my first big, you know, delves into the startup world. Um, so I'm very thankful for the college experience. And I do think it was valuable. Um, not necessarily for the reasons that most people find college value, I'd say. But then again, even you can also extrapolate that to like the person who gets a nine to five corporate job that they like, and they say, you know, well, I didn't learn anything in college, but it got me my job, you know? So maybe it's not really that uncommon, but for me, I just find it ironic that you spend four years in an institution to get a piece of paper so that you can get a job. Um, that mindset to me is, is just like, it just bothers me because it's like, why? Why do you have to do that? <laughs> but there's so many there's so many underlying things there that make that, you know, because we actually just so we're hiring summer interns right now. And one of the things one of the questions I was instinctively about to write was, what is your GPA? But then I'm like, do I really care? You know, because like that's one of those things where I was like, oh, I don't know. You know, what I mean? like, or like, do they need to have gone to school? Because it's, it's so it's so contradictory because it's like, well, there is sort of like a um, 
a funnel there where it's like, well, if you've gone to a, a, a university, you're probably, you know, it's just like a numbers game. Um, and yeah. so that's, that's why it's important. So like, there's always the devil's advocate point of view there, but you know, it can, I mean, it can be useful as a way to evaluate someone's ability to just buckle down and do work. Sure. Oh, that too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think where people maybe miss out is thinking that there's no other way to evaluate that. It's also helpful, I suppose, if you're a major company like you know IBM and you're looking at 20,000 resumes a year and you need a quick way to filter people out. It's kind of like you're familiar with Peter Thiel, the Thiel Fellowship, mm-hmm. and his whole the anti... It's, it's just you know the idea that... Well, can, can you explain the Thiel Fellowship for anyone who doesn't know what it is? So Peter Thiel he co-founded PayPal. He, he basically has this Thiel Fellowship where he gives $100,000 to college students. It gives them the opportunity... Uh, to work on their idea or their venture, but the, on the condition that they drop out of school. Um, I think it's for a year, maybe two years. Um, but the irony of the whole thing is like Peter Thiel went to Stanford Law School. He was a lawyer for like a long time. Um, right. Or I mean not a long time, but he was like, he was a lawyer and he, he went to Stanford Law. You know, he's, he's like a product of the education system. Um, but then he, here he is funding kids to just not do that. And he ended up finding PayPal. And so it's, it's kind of like you wonder, well, if he, if he had dropped out of school, for some random idea he had, would he have ever founded PayPal? Would he have ever had the skit, you know, the know-how and, and, and the education? So it's just like, there's a great irony in all of it that, um, and, and it's kind of like, well, and then you see like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg both dropped out of college, but, and then things, well, is, is there a correlation between dropping out of college and, and building a good company? Absolutely not. Um, but, um, so there's a lot of sort of like caveats to all this stuff where having a degree is definitely a good filter for, for some of the things that you said. Um, but on the other side, it, it, it very much depends on the person, but from a number standpoint, it absolutely makes sense to, for a large company to sort of filter by something like that. I think with the Teal and Zuckerberg and Gates examples too, people miss all of the silent evidence, right? We, we see these few people who dropped out and founded these massive companies and we ignore the, I'm sure tens of thousands who drop out and don't do that or it doesn't go that well. Oh, Absolutely. Every once in a while on like Product Hunt or something, someone makes a website where it's like, here are all the companies that failed. Because, um, yeah, you never hear about them. And you never hear about the thousands, like you're saying, of people who didn't. And I think the other silent factor that can be added there is like, I mean, I don't know too much about the story. I mean, you know, you watch The Social Network. And I have, you know, I am an entrepreneur junkie. I love reading all the like the startup stories, but I don't know all the details. But I, I am pretty sure they had very significant traction. Or oh, at yeah. least they were farther along before they dropped out and and i think a lot of people that are doing it today they don't have anything even remotely close to that it's just sort of like an idea maybe someone threw money at it and and there you go um so i think people ignore that aspect to it a lot too it's it's like they had had serious traction so yeah well the other part people ignore is that at harvard if you leave you can come back anytime i think Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. They, they have a pretty long window where you can leave and go work on a startup <laughs> or something. And if it fails, you can just come back and finish. Dropping out is kind of a misnomer. I mean, I dropped out of college for a year to work on a startup and it failed and we shut it down. And then I went back and finished, right? right. Like there's that whole option too. It's not really this binary decision that a lot of people think it is. Right. And, you know, so my two co-founders have another year of school. And so that was like a stressful thing is so they say in school, do they graduate? And we all decided we're going to put our heads down and, and, and just get through the last year and, and they'll have a degree and we'll go from there. But we had sort of a decision to make, which was, do we try to take this to the next level? Do we really, you know, you know, make that leap? Um, but you know, it's, it's a very tough decision that I think a lot of young entrepreneurs who are in school, like kind of face. And, um, I remember when I interviewed at Y Combinator for happening, I was like, <laughs> please accept me because then it gives me an excuse to take time off. But I, I, I needed that external validation to, to make it happen. That never came through. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's definitely, it's a crazy, it's a crazy thing that I think a lot of people jump at too quickly, but um, you know, you can't argue with Facebook and, and Microsoft. So it depends obviously. Yeah. If you were going to, go back to college with some of the knowledge that you have now, do you think you would do it differently in any way? If I were to go back, I think the the thing I would, I would focus on. So my roommate, uh, right now works at general assembly, which is like a, uh, are you familiar with general assembly? You might do a better job, but basically it's, it's like, uh, you know, if you want to do immersive or part-time programs, you can learn like a very specific skill set. You can learn how to be a front end web developer in 12 weeks. Um, you can spend nine to five on it or you can do part-time like after work. 
um, but very focused on like a specific skill. I love that idea. I love the idea of just sort of like I want to learn this skill very well uh, and focusing sort of like on a on a one by one approach. I don't love the idea of being locked into like a degree or like a like a long term program, especially just for the like the validity of it or like this the degree. I would really like to focus on sort of like value based education. Um, mm. I was just speaking with someone who's working on a value based healthcare startup where it's not about having the liability on it's about having the liability on the hospital to to ha- to treat you well as opposed to like uh you know paying fixed sums to, to insurance or whatever and and, and they hospitals really don't have necessarily have an incentive to provide you with like the best healthy care because like insurance only covers uh um like if you have depression insurance might only cover um doing nothing or or, or like, a, like a visit or like pills or something but maybe there's all these other things like seeing a therapist and and doing meditation and like other things that might actually help, but no one's going to provide that because um, it doesn't necessarily help. But my point is, uh, I guess, um, I think there's, I, I like the idea of value-based education. And that's that's what I would look for if I were to go back to college is, can I get like sort of like specific outcomes and and be very flexible with a degree or, or and those sort of things? So do you think you would focus on classes around these skills that you wanted to get good at? Or would you take a lighter major that gave you the freedom to pick and choose classes based on what you were interested at the time? Or how do you think you would balance that? Yeah, I think a combination of the two, uh, sort of the flexibility and like, I liked, uh, for example, um, well, I, I like the idea of basically being able to be flexible with your time. Uh, when you need more time to work on something, you have it, but then also having the resources and people available to, uh, help you hone your skills, things that you're interested in learning. Um, does anything like that exist? I have no idea. Um, but that would be, <laughs> that's my future when I'm big, rich and famous and can start a university or something. And <laughs> that's, that's something that I would, I would probably like found around the, be the founding ideals. I just don't think necessarily like the typical four year institutions fall in line with my like line of thinking, mm-hmm. um, which is why I'd probably opt for something like a general assembly where I can sort of do things, um, relatively on my own schedule with like very focused, honed, uh, things to learn. Um, uh, but I've always been like, I, I'll be interested because right now I'm in a grind, uh, you know, head down working on a startup and I'm not expanding my skill set as much as I used to be. Um, once I get back to that point, I think, uh, I, I've always been more of a self-taught type of person and using online resources, using peers, people that know things that can help teach me and, and call them when I need it. Um, you know, doing things like that. We were having some DevOps things with our site, uh, recently. So being able to like call one or two developer friends to sort of help us through that was really important. So like there's a combination of things that I'd probably t- turn to first before I actually turn to like a, like a university education. And you mentioned there that you've almost always been self-taught. Is that, is that true? Have you always felt that way about yourself or was there something that kind of woke you up to being able to teach yourself things? Uh, uh, how did you realize that? I think uh, it, it, there's, well, so there's, it's a difference between like people like, like intuition, you know, so if you're, if you have an app like I did and you know, you might not have a formal education on marketing or anything, mm-hmm. but you can probably have a decent idea for like a good way to launch an app. Uh, and there's a level of like, intuition there. And I don't, I think there's a lot of like soft skills, uh, that don't, are, are that have a very, it's very different from hard skills. So like a hard skill being like programming, um, like knowing how to code or knowing how to, uh, um, uh, it's, it's like, or like learning, like knowing a foreign language, like those are hard skills that like take time to learn. And there's soft skills that you can sort of have come naturally to you. Uh, and I, I don't, I think like for me, it's the hard skill is having that sort of like realization that you can teach yourself those things and it's not like impossible. Um, it just takes time. Um, was really, it was really important. Um, but I don't know if I'm necessarily answering your question. I'm not sure if there was like a, a revelation that I, I like that happened. Um, do you do you remember yeah. the first time you really taught yourself something? Was it the programming for happening, or was there things before that? Yeah, it's, so for happening was the first. Oh, well, I'm trying to think. If there was another. That was. It, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't there. have to be productive either. I mean, I feel like I got a lot of my self teaching ability from playing competitive video games, for example. Ah uh, yes, um, <laughs> I definitely taught myself how to be good at Call of Duty and um, <laughs> like. Uh, you know, computer games and stuff like that. Um, but I guess that's a little bit different. Uh, I actually, so one thing comes to mind is um, when I was in high school, I used to, uh, this is probably like, if I was ever like a really, 
crazy awesome famous person and someone was like where's the first time you uh started like entre- like what was your first like entrepreneurial thing it was i actually and I, looking back on this i realized that I, I had like a whole business operation i like uh i would actually buy iphones on craigslist and then sell them i it drove my parents crazy they're like why are you meeting with these like <laughs> people sketchy people in parking lots <laughs> yeah literally literally uh, oh man and so I would buy them though for very cheap. It was like a broken phone or an old phone or whatever. I'd fix it up or do whatever I had to do. And then I would flip them, usually sell them on eBay um, or, uh, or, or like Amazon or, or something online. Sometimes I would just also sell them on Craigslist. But like I had this whole thing and uh, it elevated. I was, I was selling laptops. I mean, I was really like hired, you know, a lot of like hardware and electronics. Um, that was my first like sales. Like, and again, I feel like I just keep like beating a dead, hurt, dead horse, but like, it was just like, I just kind of just sort of like put myself out there. Um, and just, and I didn't like, I didn't like learn, like, you know, I didn't Google like best sales tactics. And sometimes it works against me. It works against me a lot. Actually. Someone, one of my friends slash mentors, um, we're talking about negotiation. And so I, uh, I set like, I like put myself out there and put a, I was like, we're talking about some negotiation of a price for a deal. And I was like, this is what I said the deal should be. And then he was like, come on, the first rule of negotiation is you don't want to be the first person to like set the price. Or something and i don't even know if that's a real thing but i never look up at, like you know i've never read a book on negotiation i haven't read you know what i mean so sometimes it doesn't always work in your favor just sort of like running on that um but also like i don't know you learn over time and stuff so yeah that was probably my first like teaching myself just by like learning how to be a good salesman just by like when i was young just just like that <laughs> what made you doing that. yeah what made you start doing the iphone flipping how did you stumble on that my friend had the idea. He he was doing it, and I was like, "That's cool." And so we yeah. kind of were a duo. Um, he got to the level of he was like flipping cars, and it was like a whole wow whole thing. He would fix up cars and sell them, but I never got to that level. Um, I was still a small fish uh, in our little. It's like a drug, but it was for phones. Um, yeah, so that it was sort of I was inspired by my friend that was doing that. Uh, but I loved this. Is, this is what really got me going was. I couldn't believe it was like the arbitrage in it was like, Oh my God. Like someone just gave me a phone that I paid like $40 for. And I just sold it for 200 and I'm like, Oh my God, that's the coolest thing ever. Like I just made all this money. And like when when you're younger, like in high school, you're like, I'm rich. Like it was, it was super cool for me. And, uh, that got me really excited. It was just like, it wasn't even just like the money. It wasn't just like, Oh, like now I can, you know, do whatever. I have a hundred six dollars. It was, it was like, it was like, oh wow, like I just, like, I felt like I won. I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm like winning. I'm like, it was like, as I was very competitive, I played sports in high school and stuff, and it's just like it felt like I like found this like competition that I was like in control and I could just like do something that was like, ex- it was just exciting that idea that like, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not explaining it well, but it wasn't the money that was exciting. It was it was like the uh, experience of yeah doing something successfully definitely yeah this is again you know changing tracks just a little bit but you're working full-time on give butter now as a graduate right yes correct was that hard to sell to your parents surprisingly not or maybe not surprisingly um but uh they were actually extremely supportive and i was very 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 thankful for that i I, what i've kind of taken the approach with my parents and i to any and every relationship is very different with people and their parents, but I'll just say this cause it worked well for me. And I think it could work well for other people that are like entrepreneurs that are like, my parents don't understand what I'm doing or, um, you know, it's hard to explain what, what I kind of took the approach was I was very, I was always very transparent and honest. And what I would always say is like, I would try to make decisions together. I would always say like, I'm not going to do this or that without your like approval of what I'm doing. And over, like, that became like a really, so like, for example, when I was ready to graduate or was getting close to graduating, I said, my parents, I was like, mom, dad, like, this is, I really love what I'm doing and, and I want to do it when I graduate. And, um, you know, we're, we're making money and we, unfortunately we were in a position where I could support uh, the business, um, from the, from the business. So it was more of a, just sort of like a conversation around, you know, uh, I want to make this decision together. I want you to be happy for me. I want you to sort of like feel good about what I'm doing. And, and we were at a point where I had already started, you know, an app or two, you know, it wasn't like, a, it wasn't like mom, dad, I'm quitting my job. <laughs> you know, right. I'm, I'm starting this random idea. So I had sort of a track record of what I was working on. Um, 
and there was a combination of that and also just like being having them be involved the entire time like this is what i'm thinking this is what i'm working on i love talking to them i think it drives them crazy sometimes but you know i go home my brother and sister's like can we talk about something else like um <laughs> uh, you know it's it's like i talk about it a lot but um having them be like very in tune with what i'm doing all the time was really made it made the whole process like a lot easier um and i i, I don't know I, that's been really because for me emotionally that's just really important and not just it's not just like Hmm, how can I like convince my parents that like this is a good idea? It's no, it's like no, they actually are like happy for me and they think like they're happy that I'm doing what I want to do and um and and that it's going well and and, and it co- combine that I'd say also with like validity or like credibility and so like by bringing in people or partners or even sometimes like that was press like being able to send like an article to like that Washington Post article you mentioned to my parents was like awesome yeah. like you know mom dad like I'm doing something cool that like people are writing about um that is really I think really important is and from like a for anyone for anything for anyone it, the credibility is really great to have so all those factors kind of contributed to to making that relationship really good and, and making it all work out was it tough at all freshman year when you first started working on happening and getting into this yeah that was that was rocky uh well it was it was it was a little i'm not gonna i don't want to like my parents are probably gonna listen to this and so i don't want to it was really it was really good, uh, but it was it was hard because here here I was in, in Washington D.C. going to you know George Washington University, and right. a big part of why you would do something like that is to get really good internships in in you know the city, and um, you know I wasn't working like the the business I was working on wasn't making any money, and and so it was it was hard, and it was but but my parents were always I was really lucky they were always very very supportive. It was just sort of like there would sort of be every six months this conversation about you know you know, what, where's it going? How are we doing? You know, what are you thinking about? And having like sort of backup plans if things don't work out to get a job. And, um, but no, I mean, I was really lucky. They were, they were very supportive, but I think, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself. I think this is why I say it was hard is because I put an enormous amount of pressure on myself to make what I was doing work because I wanted my parents to like approve and to like really be, be happy for me and, 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 and like know that like what I was doing was going to work out which like I couldn't with, with any startup, you can't like guarantee that. I just wanted them to be put at ease. I think they were just worried that I was going to be like stuck in this like startup cycle where I was just doing things that didn't make any money and never worked out. And then I'd be like miserable because I just like, they knew how much I cared about this stuff and it just, you know, wasn't working. Um, so for me, I just placed an enormous amount of pressure on myself to make it work because I wanted them to feel good about that. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I think that was really hard for me in the beginning, but got better over time. Um, and they were very supportive, which I was very lucky. So was it a big pivotal moment or kind of shift when Give Butter started making money? Did that make things easier? Yeah. Uh, it, and again, I think now that now that you ask me and I'm sort of speaking it out loud, I think it was it was very much on my side of things, just personally, uh, how I felt and, and the pressures I placed. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is true. People always say money solves all problems when, or like sales. I guess they say sales is like yeah. the expression of startups is like sales. Sales solves all problems. Um it, I guess it applies for relationships with your parents too. Um, so, you know, it, it definitely helped. It definitely helped. Um, we talked about the financial independence and stuff and, and that having that was a big part, part of the stress of the relationship and re- removing that, um, is just, I can't even explain to you how good that feels and, um, how much that eases the, like that sort of, that sort of tension. Um, Yeah. Do you have a favorite failure or fuck up? <laughs> I got some good ones for you. This is the one that comes to my mind first. Um, with We Give Two, mm-hmm. we emailed every. We made a list of all the like top tech journalists uh, and like reporters and stuff, and put them all on one email, all in the two field. Oh God! So, <laughs> <laughs> so the first reporter to reply will get an exclusive interview with us. Um, needless to say, not only did no one respond, but we got a couple of reply alls like, screw, screw you guys. <laughs> um, it was really a stupid idea. Um, but like, it didn't like matter. You know what I mean? Like in the grand scheme of things, it's like funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we, we, that's just how we like approach things. It's just like, we come up with ridiculous ideas and a lot of them don't like, that was just like absurd. Like anyone saying that in retrospect, it's like, why would anyone ever like like do that? But we were just like, this could be like, this is a cool idea. Like, what if we got press? And like, we just didn't want to do like the normal like, just email a bunch of reporters. Like, let's try doing something like innovative, creative. Um, definitely didn't work. That's probably one of my personal favorites that I can think of. 
if you could give one book to the incoming freshman at GW, what do you think it would be? I'm not a great reader. And that is one of the biggest things I want to work on. I read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight and I absolutely loved it very okay. recently. And I was just given Lessons on History. Uh, I don't even know if that's the actual title. Yeah, um, Lessons of History, Will and Ariel Durant. History. Yes. And I've read the beginning of it and I'm like obsessed with it. Um, but I'm not all the way through it. But I have a feeling if I were to give that book to a freshman coming into school, that was what it would be. I love the idea of just like, <laughs> like people always say history repeats itself and just like summarizing like history, 5,000 years of history, you know, like 100 pages and like these themes. It's just like such a cool concept. And I'm very excited to finish it. But I have a feeling that would be the book. That's um, it's a phenomenal book. Yeah. Uh, any last thoughts or pieces of advice or max wisdom that we didn't touch on that you think would be useful to any students listening to this? Uh, I think I hit on a lot of them throughout this. Um, I would reiterate that you like people, like if you have ideas, just go for it. Like, just do it. Like, just put yourself out there. Talk to the people, like talk to people that you think could help make them happen. Don't feel like you can't learn the skills to, to make something happen. And don't feel like that's the barrier because really there's no reason why my, I should be doing any things that I'm doing other than I took that extra leap to really go for it. Um, so much of what I do is I have like the skills that I've acquired. I did not have three or four years ago. And I've never got this point without just like, just trying it, just like being experimental and, and, and putting yourself out there. So I know it's like sort of like very vague advice, but I really, that's been a, a common theme throughout my life that I think is, is applicable. And I also think people really idealize entrepreneurship and startups and, or not idealize, they, um, they have this vision or idea for what like startups and entrepreneurship is. And I think a lot of people start companies because they like the idea of starting companies. I'd really like, I really think people should try to focus on um, sort of like what is the core, what is the core at that and, and sort of solving for that thing. Like, is it, is it like you want money, you want fame, you want like, what is that thing? Um, and for me, like I said, right in the beginning is like the idea that gets me out, like excited every day is that like building something that a lot of people use and it makes their lives incrementally better. And that like that thing to me gets me really excited. So find like that thing that gets you excited because that's the thing that's going to drive you through the hard times and the good times and um, and, and solve for that. And it might not necessarily be a startup. You could work a normal job and, and accomplish that. Um, so, you know, I think those are some of my like general purpose pieces of advice, but uh, yeah. That's a fantastic note to end on. So Max, if people want to find you around the interwebs, uh, where should they look? Uh, you can hit me up at Max at givebutter.com. Send if you want to send me an email or, or chat about any things that I mentioned. I'd be happy to talk to any friend or listener of Nats. Um, you can also hit us, uh, find us on online. Givebutter.com is is our website, but you can find me personally. Um, I believe the best handle you can find me at is Max underscore Friedman eight on Twitter. But I'm not too active. But cool. those are oh, those well, are my spots. We can put those links in the show notes too. Awesome, sounds great. But yeah, thank you so much, Max, for coming on and uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, Nat. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Nat Chat. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe to Nat Chat in iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Second, if you're trying to take advantage of some of the information from this episode, be sure you check out the show notes at nataliason, N-A-T-E-L-I-A-S-O-N dot com slash podcast. And find a friend, because implementing a lot of this stuff is much easier if you have somebody to do it with. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode and you've been enjoying other episodes of the podcast, please leave it a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your casts so that more people can find it. This is the best way for it to get some more exposure and to make sure that I can keep bringing these episodes to you. With that, thank you and have an awesome rest of your day.